Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another United States Study Center webinar. Uh, my name is Simon Jackman. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Sydney and CEO of the United States Study Center. And as is customary, uh, I begin with an acknowledgement of country, a little unusual for, um, for these online events, but the University of Sydney where the United States Study Center is housed, sits on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, part of the Eora Nation. And uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we do that online or in person, but today we are indeed online. And it's a special treat today because we're joined by uh, two of our friends uh, from the United States, where it's uh, evening in Washington, and we and we thank them for joining us. We're joined by uh, Laura Rosenberger and Zach Cooper. Laura and Zach uh, are running a, a really interesting project that we are so happy to be able to share the details of with you today. The project goes by the name of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, and is supported by the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and. If you were reading the New York Times last week, um, you would have seen uh, some, some reference to some of the really interesting work being done by this project, which is using a variety of quite high tech tools to look at some of the more nefarious things going on in online domains in social media channels, particularly uh, malign foreign actors might be the appropriate form of words to use that are using social media channels as a, as a, as a vector, as a channel for, for foreign interference in all sorts of things, but of particular interest in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, but more broadly uh, in the United States, at least within the context of the election coming up in November, two sort of things that we're, we're going through right now that add great impetus and relevance to this project, the Alliance for Securing Democracy project that Zach and, and Laura uh, direct. Um, Zach is a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he studies US defense strategy and alliances in Asia, uh, as is um, typical uh, for think tankers in DC. Uh, Zach has had spells in government. He has previously served in as, as an assistant uh, to the Deputy National Security Advisor for Combating Terrorism at the National Security Council of the United States and has also served as a special assistant to the principal deputy under secretary of defense for policy at the department of defense. Uh, Laura, uh, Laura Rosenberger uh, was foreign policy advisor in the Hillary Clinton campaign. And she coordinated development of that campaign's national security policy messaging and strategy. And like Zach, she too has served in government, a range of positions at the state department and at the white house um, in the national security council there as well. And to help add some Australian perspective to the conversation, um, I'll also be joined today um, by Ashley Townsend. Ashley directs our foreign policy and defense program at the United States Study Center. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Sydney, has spent time um, in China, um, um, has uh, worked at other think tanks around Sydney uh, and Australia as well. He's a frequent contributor to um, not just the center's output, but to Australian media op-eds and a lot of commentary on, on what is a, a frantic pace of developments around the world uh, in any event, but, but it seems everything has been sped up um, and, in, and the intensity has, has grown and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for being with us. Um, Laura and Zach especially joining us uh, from the United States. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Thank you, Zach. Look, and Very glad. likewise. Great. Well, well, thanks so much um, to our colleagues at the U.S. Study Center for, for hosting us uh, for this conversation this morning. And I think it's um, an extraordinarily um, timely conversation, given uh, some of the recent developments um, in the relationship between Australia and China. But um, we've also seen um, some interesting developments between China and the European Union as well um, related to these issues. Um, so I think we can touch on a number of these different dynamics today. Um, Simon, you gave a, a really great overview of the work that we do at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. 
let me just, um, I know we're going to talk mostly about disinformation today and the social media manipulation, but what I thought I might do was start off with putting a bit of a, a broader frame around the issue because that's how we approach it in our work. Um, you know, we think about disinformation and information manipulation um, is sort of a broader way of thinking about that piece as one part of a toolkit that malign actors are using um, to coercively undermine and interfere in democratic institutions um, and democracies. And a lot of that conversation, certainly in the US, has taken place in the context of elections. Australia, of course, has had its own conversation about um, political interference by the Chinese Communist Party that has focused on um, other kinds of tools that have been used in those instances. But as you rightly point out, Simon, the COVID-19 pandemic has also shown um, really how the use of these tools is an ongoing effort um, that opportunistically takes advantage of events, um, whether those are elections, pandemics, um, other kinds of, of geopolitical markers, um, in order to use these tools for, um, for geopolitical gain. Um, and so we think about information manipulation, cyber attacks um, on infrastructure and networks more broadly, malign foreign influence, economic coercion, and subversion of political social groups or, or really you know, the manipulation and targeting of diaspora populations as part of a toolkit that malign foreign actors are using as tools to undermine and manipulate our democracy. And the developments that have recently broken in the news about you know, threats of economic coercion towards, China, uh, towards Australia, you know, um, and retaliation for calls for an independent investigation into the, the handling of the, of the virus in China, you know, really shows in quite stark relief how these tools have to be seen as um, part of a broader package. If we only look at the information piece, if we only look at the economic coercion piece, we miss the broader game and strategy that's being played by these malign foreign actors. Similarly, as I mentioned, um, last, uh, late last week, the New York Times broke a story that, um, that China had threatened the European Commission um, uh, not to release a report on Chinese disinformation about COVID-19. Um, and there are some reports that, in fact, the ultimate, um, uh, the ultimate report released by the, the East Strathcom task force that does this within the EU may have been watered down in light of Chinese threats. Um, and so, you know, again, we see the, the combination of these coercive, manipulative tools to undermine our democratic institutions, um, COVID-19 being just the latest event. So with that kind of as the broad frame, let me spend just a minute maybe on the, on the information piece specifically, and then I'm going to hand it over to Zach, who's going who's gonna to dive deeper. You know, I think one of the things that we see as a challenge in the information space as democracies is that the control and manipulation of information is something that's inherently advantageous to authoritarian regimes. In fact, you know, China, the, the Chinese Communist Party's first response um, upon reports surfacing of the virus in Wuhan was not just to control the virus, but was to control information about the virus. The control of information is central to how the party thinks about power. And that's something that also informs its external approach to the use of power, to the use of how to gain, you know, thinking about how to gain geopolitical um, leverage. And so I think we need to understand that there is, there is a, an adva advantage to authoritarian regimes in the use of that power because it's central to how they think about it. Whereas for democracies, free and open information is something that really is foundational to how we, act, how we engage in deliberative processes, how we have a shared understanding of truth, how we actually engage in political discourse. And so efforts to pollute the information space and to degrade it actually has a, de degrading a degrading effect on democracy itself. And so democracies have to think really carefully about how they respond to these kind of tactics to avoid falling into the trap of playing on the terms that our authoritarian competitors are setting out and think about the ways to engage in a manner that actually affirms the democratic information space. Um, so with those really broad thoughts to frame out the disinformation piece, um, let me hand it over to Zach, who's gonna talk, I think, about some of the more specific things we've seen from China around the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to Simon, and really appreciate the US Studies Center having us uh, 
Uh, we wish we could actually be in Australia right now, I think, uh, but obviously that doesn't look like it's going to be possible for quite a while. Um, I wanted to just build a little bit on what Laura was talking about and, and talk a little bit about um, a few questions related to this change in Chinese behavior. Uh, and I do think it's a change and I'll just talk briefly about that. So three questions. First, why are we seeing this activity now when we previously haven't seen a lot of Chinese disinformation efforts connected to these kinds of global media campaigns that they're engaged in? Second, do we think this is going to last? And third, how might the world respond? Um, and I don't wanna suggest that we have the answers. I think there may be more questions than answers on all three of those questions. Um, but I think those are the right questions for us to start investigating and, and to try and figure out the answers to. So first, um, why are we seeing this kind of coordinated disinformation campaign from Beijing? This is a big change. Uh, before last fall, we had not seen a social media campaign by the Chinese Communist Party engage in disinformation within the United States, for example. Uh, certainly there had been some around uh, the world and other countries, but really uh, these had not targeted the United States. And so this is a change in behavior, right? The suggestion by the Chinese foreign ministry and by the spokespeople from the foreign ministry and by a dozen ambassadors that in fact, the um, coronavirus originated in the United States, that it was perhaps transported to the United States by a U.S. Army team that went to Wuhan. Um, this is flat out lies propagated by the government. China hasn't done this. This looks much more like what the Russians have done um, and very little like what the Chinese have typically engaged in. China has usually focused on trying to sort of build up the Chinese Communist Party not tear down other governments or just so disinformation. And so um, I think we can have three different hypotheses for why we're seeing this change in behavior. First, it's possible that the Communist Party is just truly scared. They mishandled this pandemic. They're trying to divert attention both domestically and internationally away from the mishandling of the pandemic in November and December and January. And um, blaming others is, is one way to do that. Second, it could be that they are increasingly confident that Chinese power is relatively strong compared to the rest of the world, and they're changing their behavior as a result. I think you would hear some people say that China became far more assertive after the great financial crisis in 2008, and so maybe we're seeing this happen again. Um, and then a third argument that we're hearing increasingly is that maybe this is just some hardliners within uh, the Chinese foreign ministry trying out a new strategy and we'll see if it works. Uh, and I think that leads to the second question, which is, will it last? And will China continue this kind of disinformation? And I mean, I think if what we've seen in Australia the last few days is any indication, it seems the answer is yes. Um, some Americans had thought that um, the, the Chinese ambassador to the United States had sort of rebuffed some of these claims two weeks ago. And some Americans thought maybe, maybe that was going to start a backlash against uh, this wolf warrior diplomacy, as the Chinese like to call it. And in fact, now it looks, if anything, like uh, the foreign ministry is doubling down in Australia. And so I, I think it's very possible that this will last and it will become the new normal. On the other hand, um, you know, you might imagine that the kind of pushback that we're seeing across the board in a bipartisan fashion within the United States, Australia, and Europe, and elsewhere would force China to reevaluate these, these kinds of moves. Um, and then I think the final question is just that last one, how is the world actually going to respond? And I think on that, we really don't know. Uh, I, my fear personally is that we will overreact uh, and we will not target the specific behavior that we're worried about, but there will sort of be a, a general panic, uh, especially in the United States heading into November as uh, the Trump campaign tries to drum up concern about China and the Biden campaign feels a necessity to uh, respond in kind. Um, I think we're gonna see those kinds of moves domestically elsewhere as well. Um, but I will say, you know, up to date, I think a lot of people would say that actually the typical reaction has been underreaction, um, that we've allowed the Chinese Communist Party to dictate narratives globally without pushing back hard enough. So I think for me, those are the big questions. Why is this happening now? Is it going to last? And how are we actually going to respond? And look forward to the discussion with you guys about 
what you think the answers are and whether there are other questions we should be asking as well. And thanks for those opening remarks. Ashley, um, I'm wondering if we could come to you for sort of, I guess, your perspective from where you sit, um, directing our foreign policy and defense program at the US Study Center and, and, and therein, um, brokering a lot of the, the, you know, the way these sorts of concerns that Zach and, and Laura are, are working on in the United States, you know, A, the way they play out in Australia, but particularly through the Alliance as well. Um, yeah. No, thanks, Simon. And uh, Laura, Zach, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much uh, for your comments and insight as well. I think that what we're seeing now in Australia, um, uh, although there is a step change in Chinese disinformation, uh, if you like, globally and in an interconnected way that has more akin to, as you say, Russian disinformation, we are seeing kind of the, the standard playbook playing out with regards to the way China is trying to target, discredit Australia, and then split Australia from uh, the US, but also from other countries uh, in terms of our response and our movement into this uh, called for inquiry by foreign minister and in line with the shadow foreign minister. So, and I think that that's important to, to draw out. So just quickly on that, um, even before Maurice Payne made her comments on Insiders, uh, which for you guys is an Australian um, uh, political commentary program that runs on Sunday mornings for all of those who have nothing better to do. Um, even before she made those comments, we saw uh, Gang Shuang, the MFA spokesperson in Beijing, already alluding to uh, indirectly and in the case of the Australian, uh, the Chinese ambassador in Australia, Chung uh, Jingye, directly uh, arguing that Australia was playing to America's tune. These comments were made in various different fora and they had to do with the fact that Australian politicians were also speaking publicly about their concerns around the origin of the virus, the lack of transparency by Beijing in those early weeks and months, uh, and also about the whether or not it did originate from a wet market in Wuhan. So even before we had an inquiry, the, the, the beginnings of this campaign were there to see. That had to do with discrediting uh, Australia by saying that we are following Uncle Sam. Uh, that's a standard playbook. We see it in the South China Sea. We see it in the East China Sea disputes. We see it when Australia says pretty much anything uh, that it disagrees with with regards to Beijing and Beijing's foreign policy. Uh, and that plays to the very legitimate currents of opposition in Australian uh, domestic debate that don't agree when the government wants to take a harder line. That might be the business community. It might be other elements of the uh, diplomatic community here in Australia. They're very much entitled to their views, but China likes to sow this as Australia not being independent, which fans those flames and makes it more difficult for the government to then prosecute its policy agenda. The next part of this playbook is criticizing Australia for essentially making things worse. Um, they criticize Australia for being irresponsible in the case of COVID-19, for focusing on culpability, which is really not what the minister is talking about, instead of response, uh, which we are focused on at this point in time, uh, and therefore for essentially politicizing uh, a, an international crisis. Again, these are exactly the same words that we see when Australia supports international concerns around the ruling in the South China Sea or around the intimidation of Indonesian or Malaysian or other countries fishermen and uh, hydrocarbon explorers in the South China Sea. Uh, China then moves to reframe itself as the country that is calm and rational in the process. Uh, and we've seen this already here, urging Australia to keep calm, to not make things worse, to not fan flames, and instead to work with China uh, to improve bilateral relations, to improve the regional response. Uh, and then fourth, and, and sort of, I think, to your point, Zach, unusually, We've seen direct criticisms uh, from the Chinese ambassador here in Australia, as well as from the MFA spokesperson, that Australia is also engaging in disinformation. Um, now, um, a brief aside here, we're a US study center, so uh, I'll take the fall for everyone here. Uh, Donald Trump has not helped matters. He has engaged in his own way in misinformation. Uh, we've seen tweeting of deep fakes in the last 20, uh, in the last 24 hours by Trump on Twitter. And we've also seen horrendous lines about injecting disinfectant into the veins, which is not only misinformation, highly dangerous. So, you know, there are things there which um, point to the fact that disinformation um, by the commander in chief at this point in time has made things worse. But it is a stretch to argue that the Australian government 
or the Foreign Minister and Maurice Payne together have been spreading disinformation when they've been calling for transparency. And that brings us to essentially where we are now, Simon. Um, uh, the cherry on the cake of all of this is then um, the swagger that has accompanied the ambassador's comments over the last few days around the maybe, maybe not Chinese individuals will make the decision not to buy as many uh, crates of Australian wine this year, not to buy Australian beef, to send their students elsewhere, etc. Uh, this is done deliberately with plausible deniability. And this is one of the issues that Laura and Zach and I and a number of other uh, scholars and officials have been looking at over the last couple of years through our deterrence um, uh, and counter coercion work that we do sort of multinationally. Um, and it's designed to give Beijing essentially greater power by not issuing sanctions. The Western approach would be to say, we sanction you for doing this. This is how much, this is when it kicks in. This is what you can expect. The approach we've seen from Beijing, uh, most recently in the Australian context, early last year, when there was a holdup of Australian wine and coal on Chinese ports, is to say nothing or to suggest that it is a consumer boycott not directed by, Je by Beijing. And this is really the epitome of gray zone coercion. And it is about this, not just the disinformation that leads up to it, but the uncertainty in the minds of regional capitals about how to respond, because we're not really sure uh, and can't certainly prove that Beijing is exerting its economic leverage, uh, but we do know that it's having effect and we do know that we need to not be seen to back down on our policy positions as a result. Thanks everyone for, um, for those framing remarks. Um, and indeed, when we, <laughs> things are moving so quickly, we did, you know, we couldn't have, and we certainly didn't schedule this webinar knowing that we would have had the last 36 hours or so that we've had here in Australia with, with comments from the, from the Chinese ambassador and some back and forth from the Australian government for, for, for its uh, part as well. And, and I gotta say, uh, the, the, the shadow foreign minister um, uh, chiming in, uh, extremely strong statement um, as well um, here in Australia. Um, what I'd like to do, I, I look, certainly that's our frame and I, I definitely want to come back to that a little bit. But what I want to do, Zach and Laura, is perhaps um, hear a little bit more about the project, about um, the evidence it uncovers and hence in turn, you know, how it enables you to draw the conclusions and, and, and the statements you, you, you put forward in, in, your, in, your, in your setup. Tell us a little bit about the Alliance for Securing Democracy um, I, I could screen share if we liked. I've got the Hamilton 2.0 page open in front of me right now. I'll, 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 I'll perhaps might be easier if, if you guys perhaps describe it to us and I'll, and I'll, um, let, I'll refer people to the website or I'll, I'll take an audible from you guys if you want to do a screen share at some point. But, but, but either one of you, Laura or Zach, um, uh, Laura, it's your project. Uh, you're the director. Uh, maybe, maybe with you telling us say about the about some of the specific things and 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 discoveries that the that the project is making so um so thank you simon and, and i should also note um you know in terms of the the background on the project and i think this is relevant also in the context that you were just talking about in australia um is that the the project is a bipartisan one and zach and i co-direct it um uh, with with that frame in mind, our advisory council is bipartisan, um, and that really um, is something that is important for our work. I know that that's been something that's been sort of foundational to how um, you know Australia has thought about countering CCP malign influence from the get go, and I think that's something that we have really looked to as we think about how to approach this because we know that one of the aims of these malicious foreign actors um, is to divide us, um, to divide us in so many ways, right? So, um, so one of you already mentioned this, but you know, divide us within our countries, divide allies from each other, um, you know, and, and so one of the biggest things we can do to counter that is simply to stand together. Um, so just wanted to highlight that bipartisan piece. Um, so, so you mentioned the, the Hamilton dashboard. So one of the things that we've done with the project is number one, bring together um, experts across different functional areas and stovepipes um, to, to do that analysis I talked about across different streams, bringing together experts on disinformation and malign influence, for instance, right? To, to see these things in a more holistic way. And number two is to develop tools that um, enable us to use data and present it publicly 
um, in a way that actually shows, um, not just tells, the um you know about the activity that we're seeing I, I have a couple of things i believe having spent a lot of time in in government um one of which is that um really great think tank reports are often um the uh you know um the casualty of the bottom of the inbox or the like dust collecting on the desk um and so we wanted to in addition to doing um of course traditional reports actually present some online interactive kinds of tools um, both for policymakers, but also for other um, researchers to engage in sort of collaborative efforts. So the Hamilton dashboard that you mentioned, Simon, um, has been one of, it was one of our earliest tools. It's gone through a couple of different iterations. Um, and uh, initially we were tracking um, just Russia with the dashboard and, um, and its, um, its information operations. Um, about a month ago, I think it was a month, time right now is a very strange thing, um, we expanded it to include um, China. And what we track on the on the dashboard, and, and Simon, go ahead and, and screen share it if, you, if you've got it up and want to. Okay. Um, uh, we can just take a quick look at it for folks. It pulls in data from a number of different um, social media outlets. Um, if you scroll down just a little bit, um, so you can see here we've got, you know, for the Russian Federation and for the PRC, you can click back and forth between the two at the top. Um, and, and so what, what you see is we've got, so there, right there you've got all the Russian content. Um, and this is all from overt um, state actors. So whether this is um, official diplomatic accounts, this is state-backed media accounts, um, and I, and, um, you know, we've got, so you see at the top Twitter, we have broadcast. So for, um, for the Russia side that captures RT for the China side that will capture, um, like CGTN broadcasts. Um, it pulls in website data, what traffic is being shared. Um, and then for the Chinese side, we have UN statements, just given that we know how much they use those, um, as a, as a vector to sort of, um, you know, push, um, you know, push their, their influence. Um, and so what this allows us to do is see in aggregate form, what is the, the key content that's being driven by these, um, by these actors. This is important for a couple of reasons. So, so one, I should note that not everything you see on the dashboard is by definition disinformation. Disinformation is deliberately false information. That's one subset of what we think about in terms of information operations or information manipulation. But we certainly see disinformation narratives surfacing here. We can see when certain narratives are being pushed heavily. And if you click back to the Twitter button and, and scroll down just a moment, sorry, Simon, to make you drive this. Um, so you see the different, you know, you see the, the, how much traction each of them are getting. If you keep going down, you see the top 10 hashtags that they're, that they're tweeting about. But one of the really interesting things that you can see if you keep going down a little further, um, so is, um, so these are, these are the like essentially top 10 tweets by retweets and top 10 tweets by likes. And further down, <laughs> there's lots of data on here. Um, you can actually see, um, you can see the accounts that these actors are actually engaging with. So, so here we go, the top 10 tweets retweeted by followed accounts. So these are, so here you see Donald Trump, right? So of course the president is not a Chinese state actor that we're following, um, but his account is being heavily engaged with by these Chinese accounts that we're following. One of the really interesting things, so I'll just point out here, um, you, you may wonder why you see the Dodo account, right? The like fun animals account. Well, the reason that you see that here is these accounts, just like um, any other, you know, savvy social media outlets um, or advertisers, engage on popular topics to, to grow their audiences. So you gain followers when you engage on some of these interesting sort of happy things. Sometimes you'll see popular hashtags surfacing, but two interesting things I would just note in this context, and then you know we can we can uh, sort of go back to, to just our conversation. Um, one is that we have seen through the dashboard um, and be, with having both the China and the Russia versions 
been able to see a significant amount of intersection between the narratives that have be, are being driven by Chinese state actors and Russian state actors. Um, and in many cases, that's been Russian state actors actually piggybacking on the conspiracy theories that Chinese actors have been pushing about the COVID-19 origin. Um, the second one is actually you're, you're hovering um, right here, Simon, on this one tweet from one of Chinese foreign ministry spokespeople. Um, you see her referencing hashtag gray zone. Uh -huh. So what I'd like to point out here is the second thing that we've really seen um, that to me has been a little bit of a surprise um, as somebody who's watched China for a long time. So one of the things watching the Russian information ecosystem for a long time that we've seen is a heavy engagement with a range of sort of conspiracy theory websites or, or quasi you know, news outlets um, that basically peddle just all kinds of conspiracy theories. Those have generally been considered sort of pro-Kremlin outlets in parlance around sort of disinformation. What's been fascinating is to see the degree to which Chinese state actors have been engaging with and really amplifying the content from these conspiracy sites. And the gray zone is one of the um, one of the particularly known ones um, that, you know, again, these are mostly, um, you know, Americans who um, who work for and write for the gray zone. But we see Chinese state actors, Russian state actors. We're watching Iranian state actors. We see all of them amplifying these same conspiracy sites. And so, you know, for me, that's been a bit surprising because when Zach talked about some of the, you know, the more aggressive changes that we've seen um, from China's information strategy, you know, this real engagement with this kind of um, deliberately and, and heavily conspiracy laden content is something we first started to see a little bit around Hong Kong um, with the Hong Kong protests and some conspiracies about you know, the US ostensibly being behind the Hong Kong protests. And that relationship has, and the role of, of those sites has only continued to grow. So those are the kinds of things that, that folks can see on this dashboard. And again, this is all public. Um, and we think that's really important um, for people to be able to, to access this and go in and do some of their own analysis. Hey, that's, that's terrific. Thanks for walking us through that. Um, I thought that was really important context to to give, particularly to people Absolutely. that haven't seen it before. Um, Zach, I'm wondering, I'll give you the opportunity, since this is your baby as well, to, did, did you want to uh, amplify or add to any of Laura's observations there? And I can obviously pull the site back up if, if, you, if you so desire. No, I, the only thing I would say is that, you know, I, I think in Australia and the United States, one thing we've seen is that a strong counter to these efforts to sort of divide Americans or Australians is for uh, people on both sides of the aisle from various parties to stand together. And, you know, that's one thing that we're trying to do. I know uh, you've done a lot of work on that as well in Australia. And I think, as, as Laura said, you know, in a lot of ways, Australia is a model of how to do this. Um, and, you know, seeing the comments from Maurice Payne and Penny Wong, you know, there's, there's not a lot of daylight in between them. I often wish that we were in the same place in the United States and could speak with one voice on these kinds of issues. But I think that's one thing that's important. And just the other is, um, you know, for folks who are wondering sort of where our support comes from for this project, you know, we have been very active in trying to ensure that this is totally disconnected from any government. There's no US government funding. There's no foreign government funding for the project that we do. Um, and as, as Laura said, it's because this is really a tool for people to use to see what they think is important. And we want folks to be able to trust that the information is, is valid. So, um, you know, just a couple of, couple of framing remarks on sort of how we think about the project. Sure. And, and um, that is an impressive advisory board, if I may say so. Um, I just checked, flicked over to that part of the website as you've been speaking. Um, that, that's well done. And congratulations, guys. Um, it, it's, it's a really, uh, I think, a, a valuable thing. Um, it begins with, you know, shining a bright light on it. And, um, and that's perhaps what think tanks and people that sit in our world are perhaps uniquely positioned to do. This is not quite you could imagine a university doing this 
you could even imagine government doing it, but but I, I think this is quite appropriately, you know, something that the think tank community can and should, in this case, is um, is doing and 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 doing well at at a time of, of great importance and relevance. Um, look, I'm wondering if we could perhaps just again, having zoomed in hard, I wonder if we might zoom go out, just widen our lens a little bit, and um, I just noticed on that list of um, uh, accounts that you're tracking, A, I'm seeing Twitter, you know, and the little I know about this field, Twitter's sort of an easy enough to crack number one. Uh, it's, it's a much more open platform in terms of scraping data and, and, and whatnot. And I, I won't go into the technical detail of that. But I'm wondering if you guys could comment on, you know, this is, this is what we can see versus what we can't see, either because of what's happening on other platforms that aren't quite so open and amenable to scraping. But moreover, the sort of second order actors out there, either people that are picking up and, and I guess Twitter lets you pick that up, the retweets and whatnot and the likes and the sharing, but where people are not using handles that are easily traceable back to being sourced by a, a state actor or even just a foreign actor, um, it, it's hard to know if you're looking at a, a at a US person um, uh, or an Australian entity for that matter, um, sort of putting content up versus, so just two comments there about parts of the iceberg that might be under the water and, and how you guys are thinking about that side of it. So I'll, I'll give some brief responses to that and then Zach may wanna add. So quickly on the platform piece, Simon, you're absolutely right. Um, Twitter is certainly um, has, you know, provided a level of transparency for researchers um, that we don't really have from other platforms. Um, you know, there are a few other platforms that we are working to see if we may be able to integrate some of that um, into the into the dashboard. Um, but it is a bit of a challenge. Um, now, one thing I will say is that when it comes to certainly the overt um, Chinese party state activity that we've seen on, you know, targeting um, external audiences using Western social media platforms. Twitter does seem to have been their platform of choice. Um, you know, we've seen uh, essentially more than 300% increase in the number of um, official diplomatic Twitter accounts that from, you know, held by, you know, Chinese officials um, in the past year. Um, really actually interestingly starting just about the time of the Hong Kong protests. Um, and then really just zipping up um, through the, the COVID-19 crisis. And every day we're finding new ones coming online. Um, now, there are ways to do some research on what the, you know, what's happening on Facebook um, in some of the public groups and certainly through um, Facebook's ad transparency um, library, um, political ad transparency library, you can see some stuff and there's been some very good reporting from some peer institutions about the way that um, Chinese state-backed media outlets have been um, essentially buying what in the U.S. would constitute undisclosed political ads. Um, it's essentially promoting their stories, but these are stories that are essentially criticizing President Trump for his handling of the virus um and kind of taking other sorts of pot shots at the at the us um so there is certainly that activity there it's not something that's easily incorporated into the dashboard but there are other ways of doing that um that kind of research which leads me to your second question which is really um the 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 more covert space um and how to look at that and the way we think about the dashboard is it provides us the sort of seeds and um like kernels that we then can use some other data tools um that we have privately to you know dive in and and see what might be happening within other networks um you know that sort of attribution is is a challenge and and i i won't go into it um in depth but you know we generally don't do a whole lot of the sort of public um, disclosure of the covert accounts. Um, we work with others who do more in that space, but we sort of share information back and forth that's helpful on that front. Um, the one thing I think it's really important that you noted, Simon, is that um, we see um, state actors using more and more accounts masquerading, or in some cases, even um, of real people um, who are sort of, you know, within a domestic context. Um, 
And we see, you know, Russia obviously did that a lot during the 2016 election, um, you know, in advance of the, or sorry, during the Hong Kong protests, we saw, of course, Facebook and Twitter take down large networks um, of, of covert Chinese government linked accounts, um, you know, which had essentially been purchased um, from others. Um, other networks that had been out there, but I think that the um, you know this this question of, of of the covert space is an interesting one in the China case because um, there's a lot of question marks about how much may be happening there. We saw the as I mentioned the Hong Kong example, um, but then we've seen you know the um, the report that surfaced last week. In fact, that um, you know the intelligence community in the U.S. believes that um, Chinese actors, um, Chinese, I think they call them agents or operatives in the US, um, had actually amplified false text messages warning about a lockdown coming in the US, um, which seems to be a message you know, stirred up to encourage people to be fearful and maybe not trust the government. Um, so I think we have big question marks about how much is, is happening in that space. Um, and it's an area that needs a lot more research. Hey, Ash, I'm wondering if I might come to you for some Australian sort of perspective on, on the, some of the specifics that we just saw on the Hamilton 2.0 dashboard. Um, and, and, and moreover, perhaps a more medium level, high level takeaway on, you know, where the Australian strategic affairs community might be more broadly on thinking through, you know, Australia's exposure yeah. uh, to, to some of the stuff that Laura and Zach have been unearthing in the US? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, first up, in the absence of a, a platform like Hamilton 2.0, um, gauging a similar level of you know, sort of granular detail for the Australian debate and the extent to which, uh, you know, Australian targeting um, actors might be operating in similar ways here isn't possible. Obviously, I think we have seen some pretty, like I said before, um, forward leaning comments from the ambassador uh, here in Australia. Um, that go above and beyond similar comments made in the past. Um, some cheap shots haven't been taken, which is interesting too. Just as an aside, the move by the government, I think um, uh, about a month ago to review all, um, uh, to review everything, uh, all foreign direct investment through the Foreign Investment Review uh, Board here in Australia, uh, in order essentially to ensure that other foreign actors, not just governments, but foreign actors in general weren't taking advantage of bargain basement prices for Australian corporations, uh, which was sensible from the point of view of resilience and the recovery of COVID-19 here in Australia. The ambassador was asked directly about that and he didn't um, seek to sow any um, um, acrimony around that point, specifically saying that it did make sense for Australia to do that and they would continue to hope that Australia would take a non-discriminatory uh, approach to Chinese trade and investment into the future. So, you know, there, there is a bit of a mixed bag there, which is interesting to note. Simon, to your broader point about how Australia is um, viewing all of this from here, uh, I think two points. One is on the issue of trust. Uh, we've seen pretty high take up by the government's voluntary app in the last 48 hours uh, to track interactions between people who may then prove to have COVID-19 to affect to, an effective, uh, to effectively allow for better contract tracing here in Australia. It's all done on a voluntary basis. I think there were concerns that um, low levels of public trust in government are linked to some ongoing issues that government and the media uh, have been playing out here in Australia between the government and the media rather in recent years um, might have seen that take up be slower. I won't comment on whether or not it's enough or we'll get there, but I think that that is an encouraging sign for levels of public trust in our government. On the flip side of that, uh, again, in the absence of opinion polls that can gauge Australian views uh, on this particular issue, we can only speculate, but it is clearly notable that over the last five to six years, the debate in Australia about um, Chinese interference generally about disinformation specifically in recent months, which is really the only time we've seen this percolate to the level that we have uh, now in terms of public awareness about disinformation specifically, the debate has shifted uh, markedly. Um, it was very um, 
likely that a few years ago you would find huge amounts of disagreement when it comes to the role of Chinese money in business and universities and political parties across different sectors of the population, different parts of politics. By and large, everyone recognizes that there's a problem. And that's key uh, because to go to, I think, something about the response to gray zone coercion, of which disinformation is a subcategory uh, moving forward, it's critical that Grey zone coercion plays out in the cracks, to, to, to what Laura said at the beginning, in, in the cracks of our democracy, but in the places that are most critical to our democracy, the media, our political parties, our structures of governance and our institutions. Uh, any attempt to lock them down so that they are invulnerable to external penetration would compromise that very nature of boisterous public debate and free flow of information. So we need to both, in order to regulate and, and, uh, and protect without blocking down um, those critical elements of public disagreement, discussion and policy debate, you do need to bring the public with you. And I think we've seen a coordinated campaign, not just in Australia and lots of countries, but here in Australia in recent years to educate the university sector, vice chancellors, uh, key uh, directors of university-based research and development centres, parts of the media and so forth, business community, to be attendant and attentive to the, uh, the risks uh, that misinformation plays, but, but more broadly, the risks that overexposure, over-reliance uh, on single markets, on certain relationships that are not necessarily always um, fully disclosed uh, with regards to foreign actors of all nationalities. Um, that awareness has risen, and that is trickling down through, I think, a greater public acceptance that there's a problem. Um, one final point here, Simon. Um, it's very easy for this debate to slide into racism, and we must always push back against that. I think all of us who are here on this call in different ways have made this point um, before, um, but it's, it's always disheartening to see sensible comments made about CCP actions online, on social media, whatever the platform, turn to the worst elements of society that are out there and turn to finger pointing and blaming but racism and bigotry and we must push back against that because that is equally corrosive to our shared objectives yeah well said ash and um and i think it echoes uh some some remarks i heard from laura and zach at the very top of the hour um democracies face a just a, we are structurally wide open um to, to these sorts of threats and, and a determined adversary will use things that we consider our strengths, our openness, or the way we compete with one another in the information space and, and consider that as one of our founding strengths um, as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a weakness. Um, and, and I think the way to, to remedy that is to one, recognize it and have a mature grown up conversation about it. And, and that's, what I see the work of this project of, of, of the work that Laura and Zach are doing um, is, is, a, is a key first step in that, that public conversation. But well said, Ash, on the, the final comment about, about racism, because that too <laughs> becomes a point of vulnerability. Perhaps the worst thing you can say to an Australian, uh, or certainly in, in a university setting or in the think tank space, um, is, is, that they're a, uh, is that they're a closeted racist. Uh, you will put that person on the back foot immediately. And it is such a corrosive um, um, thing to introduce to, to, uh, to what is otherwise a, a sensible debate. And, um, but, but just emblematic of, I think, a symptomatic of the challenges we face. Look, time is going so quickly. I do want to get the questions from participants. We've already answered, I think, uh, a great question from, um, pardon me while my gaze goes down to the spreadsheet here of questions. Uh, we've already answered a great question from Olivia Hanna, uh, who is affiliated with the Jeff Bleich Center um, for the US Alliance and Digital Technology at the University of Adelaide. And that was the question about what's happening in Australia and about trust. Thank you. Um, and I thought, Ashley, your comments about the uptake of the app, uh, for instance, is a great sign, I think, of sort of the way the COVID pandemic, at least in Australia, has, I think, if anything, cemented uh, Australian trust in, 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 in institutions and in government institutions. Um, look, there's a question here about how, you know, and this has come up both live, uh, Haley Channer has asked this question. I think it is relevant to Australian interests as well, Ashley. So this is one perhaps for, for everybody. 
Look, Zach and Laura, already, uh, Laura, you've already indicated on the call, um, you know, incredible sort of awareness of um, what's happening here in Australia. But I'm wondering if that extends to sort of what's happening in the region and out, you know, Southeast Asia. Um, are you guys sort of tracking the way that different countries in Southeast Asia are more sympathetic or more exposed to some of the Chinese deep information campaigns uh, around COVID-19. I'm wondering if that's part of, if not an explicit part of the project, um, but something you guys are, are thinking about and talking to people about in Washington. Maybe I'll take Haley's uh, question because uh, I think it's a good one, but we, we don't have a lot of tools to look directly at that issue. But I think there are some ways that you can look at it obliquely. So one is, obviously we know that a lot of countries in Southeast Asia use different types of social media. Um, Facebook, for example, is really big in much of Southeast Asia, right? And so I think you can look at the differences of how the Chinese Communist Party tends to message on those different platforms, and it does tell you something. Um, for example, in the Philippines, you've seen a huge amount of discussion about uh, China providing masks and test kits recently, um, but we don't have a way to easily track that uh, through a lot of what we do. Uh, and compare, say, country to country. But if you go into the tool, you can break down, for example, uh, the targets that are being looked at and which countries. And so you, you can you can get a lot of information, but there's no direct comparison that's particularly easy to do within the tool. Um, but I, as I said, I do think we're seeing that um, a lot of this focus from China, from the foreign ministry in particular, has been on the United States it's been on Europe, it's been on Australia. Um, that's really where I've seen the disinformation campaign. I have not seen that much of the disinformation campaign target uh, smaller countries or even countries in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, that are, you know, you would think that this might be an, an obvious place for this kind of messaging, but I, I just haven't seen it. But Laura may want to add more on that. No, I, I, I think Zach um, covered it well. I mean, these questions of, of the regional impact is something that we get a lot. Um, and it's something we have a lot of interest in, in looking at. Um, but as, as Zach said, it's, it's a question of the tools, some of what we talked about earlier, Simon, on the data, data access thing, and, and also a bit of capacity on our end. Um, you know, obviously, the Southeast Asia question is, is particularly relevant um, for this audience, but I, I also personally am a little bit obsessed with what we're seeing in both Africa and, and Latin America, um, because both China and Russia are extremely aggressive in their information strategies in those spaces. Um, and I think that that's about a broader multilateral play, um, you know, in particular, how the role that, that a lot of those countries can play um, in, in um, you know, UN institutions and other multilateral institutions, and of course, Southeast Asian countries fall in the in the same bucket there. So, um, you know, I we um, a lot of our success on, when we've done deeper dives on some of those issues has been working with partners who have deeper capacity in, in some of those regions. Because I agree, it's it's really important. Yeah, just jumping in there too. I mean, two quick points on on the region, and this will pivot also to answer Hunter Marston's uh, question about um, what can middle powers do together to combat disinformation in the region. So I think these issues are linked. Um, we did see a bit of back and forth between the Australian um, Foreign Minister and the um, and Chinese spokespeople with regards to the Pacific Islands issue, where you had an Australian. Um, cargo plane that couldn't land in Vanuatu in order to uh, deliver aid because there was a Chinese contracted airline there. Now, you know, that particular issue, I don't think anyone ever got to the bottom of it as to whether or not it was deliberate or not. Um, the issue itself may have been inadvertent. Uh, around that, there may well have been an opportunity for disinformation that we of the kind that we saw. And I think that goes to Laura's point about disinformation being both something that is very strategic and propagated ahead of time. Like to recap what I said before, we saw comments about Australia playing to the US tune about a week or more before Maurice Payne called for an inquiry. But at the same time, this information can also be highly opportunistic and it can be very, very agile. So we have to have these two gears in mind. Um, with regards to the region, um, you know, it's been, and there's been a lot of domestic debate about this um, as to whether or not the foreign minister was right to go ahead and call for an inquiry uh, before, in a sense, she got her ducks in a row and got some in other international countries on board. Um, I think um, clearly it would have been preferable, uh, however, that it had been done had we had a coalition of like minded middle powers or even not like minded middle powers that were already now 
10 days on sharing Australia's call. We don't have one country that supports us at the moment. I think the key country here for the region is Japan. Uh, Japan is a major supplier um, of infrastructure finance. It's a major supplier of aid, including medical aid to the region. It's a country that probably is most closely aligned to Australia in terms of regional order building in the absence of, let's say, sufficiently committed um, you know, US foreign policy at this point in time. And the two countries together, as well as with the US and others, have done a lot of good in the region. So, you know, I think one way that middle powers um, can respond, therefore, to answer uh, Hunter, your question, is for uh, countries like Australia and Japan to, again, ahead of time, broaden out uh, their work with others in the region about free and accurate information. Uh, that could be um, uh, initially by taking uh, sort of domestically based pledges about the freedom of the press. Uh, this importantly wouldn't be something that would exclude a non-democratic countries in the region like Singapore and Vietnam uh, that also have, at least on certain issues, um, most of the time, uh, free press and free discussion of course not on all issues. Uh, it's a tricky one to navigate. No issue in the region uh, can, uh, can uh, um, be blind to regime type and many of those regimes aren't going to change. Uh, but I think that a, a movement towards free flow of information, perhaps towards free flow of international uh, information on certain international issues like COVID-19 is a way to uh, jumpstart that process. This is from... Um from Donald Maynard, a um, great friend of ours, um, works in the US uh, consulate here in Sydney. It's a, it's a really great question, uh, back to Zach and Laura in the US. And Donald asks, focusing back on the use of social media as a tool for propagating disinformation, have you seen a difference in where the approach is gaining traction and where it has failed? Do you have any insights on why some audiences are more or less vulnerable? So cross-sectional variation in the population with respect to where this lands. Um, Open-ended to Laura and Zach on that one. Maybe I'll just say a word real quick, which is that we, we can't really tell you a lot about um, the effects in some ways that this is gonna have on individuals. You can see some of this in the data, but, it, but we don't really look at that. But I, I would just you know put up a couple of flags of warning here. One is that um, in the places that have partially democratic systems that China knows best in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, these kinds of campaigns haven't been particularly successful in the last year, right? We've seen elections go the opposite of the way that Beijing wanted them. And whether that's because of social media or not, I think it's hard to say, but I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that the Chinese or uh, the Chinese foreign ministry is gonna be happy with the results that they're getting. I think you're seeing real blowback, you know, and I can just tell you in Washington, right? on both sides of the aisle, deep anger about this kind of disinformation around the COVID pandemic. So I, I think there may be some really substantial blowback, but, but you'd have to look pretty carefully at the data. And, and our tool gives you really a lot of tools to look at the messages that are coming out from Beijing and how they're being received in some parts of Twitter and elsewhere, but it can't really do that cross-sectional variation uh, the way you, you might want. Maybe we'll be able to go there in the future, but we, we can't do that right now. This is a great question. We got very early on in our hour from uh, Dimitri Burstein. And, and it, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Why does not state-based, sorry, why do not state-based disinformation campaigns, particularly in elections, escalate into Causes belli are, are, the, are the words that Dimitri actually uses here. I, th I think that's a that's a fascinating question. Where this sits in the escalatory schedule, if you will, of, of actions that states can take to one another, and it might really go to the heart of what we mean by grey zone measures. Or, but any or all three of you, real quickly, to take a stab at that one. I mean, Ash, I think, probably has some great insight from the deterrence dialogue conversations that he mentioned earlier. Um, I would just know quickly, I mean, you know, part of the challenge is that these asymmetric and hybrid tactics are deliberately designed not to um, trigger what we tend to think of as, um, you know, crossing the, the line of what is, in fact, warfare. 
Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, I mean, that's been the case in the broader cyber conversation more generally, you know, lots of conversations about what actually would cross that line um, and still lack of real consensus on that. But one of the things that I argue, and I'll shamelessly plug a foreign affairs piece I recently wrote, um, that talks about the global information contest. And I talk about why I actually think that while Beijing and Moscow certainly think about what's happening in the information space and cyberspace as warfare and on an ongoing basis, that democracies actually need not to do that. Because when we think about information as a weapon and the ongoing contest is warfare, I think that fundamentally undermines the pillars of democracy based on a free and open information space. I think about it as a contest in a very contested space where um, democracies need to affirmatively engage, but to do so in a way that's consistent with democratic principles. Um, but that's a that's a very easy thing to say and a harder line to walk. But um, I, I'm sure Ash has some some thoughts here too. Uh, look, Laura, I agree with all of those comments and look, very conscious of time, so super quick. Um, uh, the way that grey zone competition generally and disinformation specifically is often characterized in the discussions that we have is the the day-to-day -day reality of strategic competition in the region it's something we need to live with and that's as distinct from warfare it's not an attack uh, it's an attack on freedom on freedom of information of course but it's not an attack per se on, um, on, 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 on one of the equities, national equities that we might have that would warrant a military response. I think that's, that's very clear. Does it warrant an, an, a response in kind in terms of information warfare? I think Laura's points are really well taken. Uh, um, at the same time, obviously in certain much more circumscribed military contexts, uh, there is and has always been scope for militaries to engage in information operations uh, for a range of reasons uh, that has uh, traditionally been in the toolkit of Western liberal democracies. Uh, it may have been downplayed in recent times, uh, but it's often also used uh, in, in, you know, uh, in, in ways that are very constructive uh, to uh, social order building, as we saw in the Middle East in many cases, providing information in an information denied environment may be construed by your opponent as information warfare that serves a very important purpose. So look, that's uh, Simon, you've opened a can of worms there in the, in the closing seconds of this. I'll just leave it there for now and uh, put Zach in the hot seat. Uh, throw that one on the table um, uh, with 60 seconds to go, and especially for you, Ashley. And, and that's my way of signaling that, look, this is a topic that the United States Study Center in particular is deeply invested in, um, the, the, how to think about and conceive uh, these sorts of interactions might we say between between states and 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 frame them appropriately what's the right strategic and operational vocabulary for these things that's a big project that ashley directs at the study center but in partnership um and in constant collaboration with our friends uh in washington zach and laura chief among them uh thank you for your time tonight in washington um these webinars we're doing uh, have just been remarkable um uh, sort of um turning this sort of awful predicament, particularly of tragedy in the United States, but turning it into an opportunity uh, to use this mode of, of, of reaching out and engaging with people with whom the rest of the time we have quite close collaborative relationships with over email and occasionally face to face, but long overdue that we, we, we in, engage this way. And, and I hope there's another opportunity to come back to, to this topic, perhaps as we get a little further down the road towards the November election, uh, Zach and Laura, I'd be very interested to pick up on this. So much we could have where we could have taken the conversation to about the way that this debate, in particular, this recent events, are playing into the presidential election, and and um, perhaps that's a topic we'll come back to you for some insight on. You know, a little further down the road, this intersection between um, foreign foreign inspired or foreign driven misinformation and the way it's intersecting with domestic politics with COVID-19 obviously a huge lever. Thank you so much Zach, thanks Laura, thanks Ashley, thanks to the team back at the US Study Center for keeping things humming along. Thank you all, see you again, see you next time, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.